All right. Uh, like this, like this. All right, so welcome everyone to Node Workshop presented by SES in collaboration with Autodesk. So first thing first, uh, make sure you're in the Slack because I am posting everything there. I, I just posted the material there. I'll be sending also uh, uh, everything that you need for the workshop. You could send questions there. So first things first, make sure you have the Slack. Uh, uh, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending uh, attending this workshop, uh, you know, for taking the time. I understand it's a difficult time for, for all of us, you know, yeah, you're taking care of, of of, of yourself and maybe other people and then some people may even have midterms for those who are in, in, in university but you know you, you still take the time to, to invest in yourself and to learn something new so really thank you so much uh i've been doing these workshops for for a while now with ses but this is the first time that i'm doing it uh online so hopefully it goes well as always if if you notice there's any uh audio problems, uh, if you're not hearing what I'm saying right now, uh, it's gonna be on Slack, so message me on Slack. I might not look in the YouTube chats. Uh, yeah, so first things first, uh, I sent the material on, on, on Slack, so just open it up in your browser. It would look something like this. I, I have it a little bit zoomed, so let me show that a little bit. All right, so this is the uh, workshop homepage. I'll, I'm just gonna go through uh, one by one in the introduction stuff. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm Lenny, my name's Lenny. Uh, I'm a web developer at Autodesk on the shotgun team. I graduated at Concordia University and the only reason I'm mentioning that is uh, most of you are probably from Montreal, so you know Concordia. Uh, I did uh, web services and applications. And I'm also a mentor, so make sure you reach out for details. That's my uh, laptop, because I can't show you my laptop right now because it's online. I can't show you the back of my laptop. So I have those stickers uh, from hackathons. I, I love going to hackathons. Uh, although, as you can see, it's not full because I graduated, so I can't go to hackathons anymore. Uh, that's me at Hack the North. Uh, I also went to Konyu Hacks uh, a few times. Uh, I just don't have a picture. And those are my uh, details. You could visit my website. Uh, you could follow me on Twitter, send me an email, uh, follow me on, on, on Dev or, or, or LinkedIn. Moving on. So you must have seen this, this slide because this is the same thing as the slide that was uh, sent to you when you registered. So these are just preliminary things to make sure you have everything you need for the workshop. Uh, yeah, you need you need Node definitely. Uh, you also need Git because we're gonna use Git to to switch branches, and you also need uh, MongoDB. Uh, I'm gonna give you some time later if ever you didn't do do these things yet. But uh, right now we're gonna move on. Uh, nice to have. So yeah, uh, JavaScript ES6. We're gonna discuss it here. Uh, if you had time before. It would have been nice if you read it, but it's okay if, if you didn't. Uh, all right. But first, before we start, I want to see a little message from uh, from Autodesk, who really uh, provided us uh, some Uber Eats gift card today. Uh, so Autodesk is a company that develops software for architecture, engineering, construction, media, education, entertainment industries. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Autodesk, uh, we do construction software and uh, develop uh, globally. You have AutoCAD, Revit, uh, you know, AutoCAD is for computer-aided design, Revit for, for uh, building information modeling, and we have Inventor and Fusion 360. In, in Montreal, uh, specifically our office in Montreal, uh, we developed the media and entertainment software. So you have uh, Maya for 3D animation, uh, 3ds Max for, for 3D modeling, Flame for VFX, uh, Arnold for illumination, and uh, my team is Shotgun. I'm part of the Shotgun team, which is a, a web app for project management and pipeline tools for uh, studios. So 
a quick info on Autodesk. Let me just pull up something here. Right. So yeah, I'm just sharing here some articles on uh, that tells you more about about the the products in in Shotgun, uh, the the products in Autodesk, specifically. And uh, yeah, so Autodesk existed since about thirty years. Uh, it develops products that allows you to make anything. It could be a building, a, a bridge, or the shoes you're wearing, a, a game, or three D model. Uh, and actually, from the last uh, Oscars, the, the Academy Awards, uh, I have it in this article that uh, some of the movies the, that won on or are nominated actually used the Maya Arnold Shotgun and Flame to develop to develop those, those movies. So it's kind of cool. You could read the article there. And uh, Shotgun Sopper is my team. So they're used by by you know by AAA games. If you're into gaming, uh, some of these. You probably know Ubisoft, EA Sports. Uh, there's more details in that link. Uh, and we're also trusted with uh, with uh, movie studios, film studios, game studios. So uh, if you know Game of Thrones, uh, there's a lot of details here on, on how, how they use shotgun software to, to deliver uh, things for Game of Thrones. So yeah, uh, let me show you this quick video. Oops. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Thank you for for letting me know that I'm that I'm muted. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, doing things online. Thanks. So I I fixed that. So what I was saying before is uh you know I'm very passionate about programming and web development and I like learning about web technologies used in the industry today, and you know doing workshops to share to share this knowledge and I would love to know. To share what I know about Node and hopefully inspire you to make web applications, and you know this is really what the Autodesk Education Outreach Program is all about. We hope to prom promote STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, and we hope to inspire you to to make anything. And 
Autodesk provided us uh, some some Uber Eats gift card gift card to the ones who registered early. So, you know, we hope to fill your your hunger with with the uh, with Uber Eats gift cards. It's kind of a lunch and learn, but it's a late lunch, so maybe a supper. Uh, and definitely fill your hunger for learning nodes. So thank you, Autodesk. Uh, all right. So I hope I'm uh, I fix my audio now. Uh, all right, so we're gonna go ahead with the workshop introduction. First of all, uh, you've also seen this in the package. So what you're gonna learn in this workshop is uh, not just Node, but also web server fundamentals. Uh, this is gonna be a good foundation for your next web projects. So these are some of those topics. Uh, yeah, so these are mostly uh although we're using node and express a lot of this knowledge you could definitely uh use for it's the, the kind of a general knowledge for for web servers so that's that's the most important part uh but first i want to talk about you know the what and the why it's very important for for us to take a step back so why are we doing this why is the the back end important uh what is a back end so short answer to that is, let me make this bigger. So a server or, or backend, uh, it serves. That's why it's called a server. It serves uh, pages, data, and, and uh, some logic, some processing to the clients. We're gonna discuss that further. But uh, so the question remains: So why do you need a backend? There's this uh, funny tweet that I found. So why do we need a backend? Why not just connect front end to database directly? Uh, and someone answered, it's actually a funny answer. It's kind of half true. So why do we eat and go to the bathroom? Well, you know, you can throw the wood directly in the toilet because stuff needs to get processed. So that is the main role of, of, of the backend. Uh, although you could definitely get away with uh, with no backend for if you're just doing a, an HTML, CSS uh, demo. Uh, but as soon as you need some processing, you definitely need a, yeah, definitely need, need a backend. So, so these are those things that you can do in, in, in the back end. You could store, process, and serve data. Uh, it's also going to house your, your, your domain logic, your business logic. And the nice thing is that it, the important thing is that it's separate from UI logic. So you don't clutter your UI logic with, with all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, business logic. Uh, so there's a separation of concerns there. Uh, public API. Uh, this you might have encountered uh, one time in hackathons that you want to use an API, but you know HTML just can't just fetch data from somewhere. You need a you need a because course is is blocked, so you need a you need a server to do the querying for you, and you know perform heavy computing that the browser can't do. Browsers are really powerful nowadays, and a lot of these processing are, are starting to get off offloaded to the browser, but there's still limitation. Like if you're doing uh, machine learning or uh, media transcoding, all that heavy processing stuff, you really need a server. You, you can't just, you know, expect the client's browser to do those, those things. Uh, so first, what is Node? Node is a, a runtime environment for server-side JavaScript. It's built on Chrome's V8 engine. So when it was conceived, uh, it actually originated from, from, from the browser, from Chrome. And so it has kind of the same uh, properties. It's single-threaded, non-blocking, and event-driven. Asynchronous, it uses the event loop. Uh, if those words don't mean anything, don't worry. We're going to have a uh, closer look at asynchronous later. But uh, that's the keyword here, uh, single-threaded and, and asynchronous. So keep that in mind. And these companies use nodes. Uh, it might not even be that updated. But uh, you know you you must recognize some of these companies, so they use Node in their backend. Uh, so we're not gonna discuss HTML or, or client side JavaScript and CSS. You're gonna see some of them maybe at some point if you get that far, but uh, we're not gonna discuss them to save time. It's also not a code along stream that you might have seen some code streams that uh, you know the host types uh, line by line. We're not going to do that here to save time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the code. I'm going to explain what's happening in the code and the concepts, and we we switch we just switch branches and see how they work. 
you're going to see some ES6, but uh, we might not cover all of them. Uh, so yeah, let, let's please communicate on Slack. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the YouTube uh, chat is limited and there's a little delay, probably a 30 second to one minute delay. So Slack, if you send me a message, I'm going to, I'm going to read it right away. A little intro on Notion, which is uh, whatever you're, you're viewing this from right now. This is Notion page. Uh, how do you navigate that? There's like breadcrumbs on top. If ever you get lost, uh, you could just click here on top and, and those uh, nice shortcut links and links uh, shortcut to links that you're used uh, you used to are, are, are they work you could do control click and stuff like that so you could do search there on the top uh, you could even log in but that's not necessary for this workshop uh, yeah so when in doubt just click at the home page here on top and it's gonna take you to the to the main uh, to the main page which is this. So once you're back here, you could navigate the chapters. Uh, yeah, so if, if you had a glance on, on the material, it's, it looks like a lot, right? It's a lot of, it's a lot of words and we're gonna see the GitHub later. It, it's a lot of code, it's definitely a lot of code. But the thing is, we're gonna discuss as much as time allows. So the rest of the material will go to the part two. So hopefully, you, you all can make it to part two, but the idea is hopefully we get to discuss the core, the core, uh, the core web server stuff that you could probably start building already. So when when we meet again for part two, maybe you already built your your, your little server. Uh, part two would be more uh, complementary to to that. Uh, try to not get overwhelmed on the details. Uh, like I said, it's a lot of material. Try to understand. Uh, the concepts and the patterns. I'll try my best to explain things, but it's definitely a lot of material. There's no way you could remember the, all of this or, or the very least even understand all of this in, 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 in one sitting in three hours. So uh, the thing is, you're going to have access to this material later. Uh, and the material is kind of a complete resource by itself. That's why there, there's a lot of details in there. Uh, if you like taking notes, uh, Try to listen more than taking notes, because, like I said, the materials can be available. So you might not, you might not even need to take a lot of notes. Uh, and yeah, so try to focus on on the reflection later on how you can use this knowledge, because this is the most important part of this workshop that I want you, to, to want all of you to get. Said, so okay, we're gonna see how how Node works, uh, and the most important thing is that you could finally use it, because when you finally use it into your projects and build something, that's when the further learning comes, not when looking at the material, right? Uh, so we're gonna have breaks or, or activity at the end of every chapter, usually around 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so that's your time to process, review, reflect on the material. You could try the challenges if you want. Uh, you could ask questions in Slack, or you could go for a break. And yeah. Don't hesitate to ask questions and get help. Uh, try to use the channels. You could post in general. Some people uh, send message on the general uh, channel already, or you could put in the node questions. So we'll, we'll see uh, if uh, whoever actually posts a question, the question there. Uh, yeah, so if, if you don't get to ask your question during the workshop, I'm, I'm going to stay like around 30 minutes after the workshop. So to, to help you guys out, if there's anything. And there's going to be a survey later, so I'll give time at the end of the workshop to fill out the survey. If ever you have to leave early, please, 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 please fill it out. It, it would really help us in, improve the workshop. Uh, you're going to find the survey in the home page right here. So just click that. Uh, all right, so on to the next part, navigating the material. So. I really hope you you did this part. This is one of those uh, setup stuff that, that was sent to you in in Google Slide. Okay, well that's loading. Uh, so that really sets up your node environment. You know to uh, which branch to use and how to set up your VS Code and your node. Uh, but the summary is that it's this thing. So 
you you stop the server by doing control C. Let me actually split that. So we're gonna split, split uh, VS Code in this view. All right. So uh, you know, control C to stop the server. Uh, how we're gonna do it is we're gonna check out branches. So you just do git checkout dash F. So we're forcing the checkout, you know, just, just to make it easy. And then you do which, whichever chapter you wanna see. And then you do uh, npm install and npm start. When you're going from, from a, a later branch to a, a lower branch, you might not have to do npm install, but just in case you have any problem starting the, the code, the, the server just do npm install and npm start. Uh, how the document is structured is, is we have branches, right? We have chapters and branches. So for each chapter, there's a branch in, in GitHub. So chapter 1.0, there's a uh, C1.0 branch in GitHub. So it's equivalent, so you could easily navigate between the code. Uh, so that's how you view it, view that thing in, in GitHub. Right, so let's say this is your GitHub. Uh, so I hope you you got the chance to fork the repo and then check out your branch. So you could check the branches here. Right. Uh, oops. Not that one. Uh, okay. Also not that one. Uh, so that's the usual flow. Uh, switch branches, install the packages, start the server. Uh, if you want to do your, if you want to keep your own changes, uh, if you know what you're doing, if you know Git very well, you could stash, you could check out, then push, but I'm, I'm not going to go through this uh, in details because I only suggest that you do this if you really know Git well, uh, because it's going to take more time. Uh, troubleshooting, if ever you get any uh, weird NPM errors later, uh, there's these two commands that, that you can try. It just flushes out everything from your branch uh, to a, kind of like a clean state. And actually, I want to show this too. So when you go through the material uh, by your own, uh, you could compare branches in GitHub. So let's go to this link. Get that link. So the nice thing with GitHub is it allows you to compare two branches. And we're actually going to use this uh, throughout the workshop. So here you can see that this part got deleted from, from this previous branch. And then all of this stuff got added with a green from, from the new branch. So just keep in mind, we're using we're going to use this a lot to compare. Uh, anything else? I think that's it for now. Uh, yeah, one last thing, uh, it's gonna make it so much easier if you can switch between three terminals. Uh, okay, I'm gonna fix that error later. So in my VS code here, uh, if you can uh, do this, it, it'll be really great. If you already did the, the VS code stuff from, from before, it's fine. But this just allows you to switch between terminals very, very easily. So it's a shortcut. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to try to do that here. So open your keyboard shortcuts and paste that there. I already have it there, so I'm not going to do it. But what this allows you to do is that when you add a new terminal here, uh, actually, if you don't have a terminal yet, you could access that from here, terminal, new terminal. But if you already have a terminal and then, and then you want to add, so you could do the plus. So now we have three terminals. And the nice thing is I can switch quickly. So I'm just doing that, that keyboard shortcut. I can't really show you, but this is super useful when you have npm here, you have git here, and then you have curl here. So that's just a quick tip. Troubleshooting, uh, you're probably not going to need that, but consult this part if ever you run into weird errors all right so uh we're gonna start with the first chapter 
if you have any questions, like I said, just uh, post them on Slack, all right? Let me just grab water. I'm gonna hide my video now to, to also have a bigger window. All right, so you should see now my, my, my screen, it should be, the right side should be the Notion page and the left side should be the VS Code. All right, so get started. Uh, I'm gonna just that a little bit. So uh, let let me know in Slack if if it's too small the text. I could maximize it for you because, but it's just from my screen. It's already kind of maxed out. Uh, okay, yeah. There's a question in Slack. Uh, this is for uh, chapter chapter one. Uh, okay, hold on. I am just getting some uh, messages on Slack. So I'm going to give you the repo. So yeah, I sent you the, the, the repository. Uh, all right, thanks, Steve. Uh, all right, so we're gonna start with just the basics. So as you all know, any programming language that you start, we gotta start, we really have to start with Hello World. So if you have the, the branch, I'm actually gonna put my branch back to, to dev. So we start together. All right, clear. So you have your, your initial files from the dev branch, sorry. And then you do server node server.js. And oh, that's weird. Yeah, I don't know why 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 VS Code does that. But uh, yeah, so when we do node server.js, you see the you see the the console log from the server. So quick intro, uh, you know, console log allows us to, to write. To the server output it's commonly used for logging and debugging you're going to use this a lot in 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 backend and front-end development if you're using javascript and uh yeah so we accomplished that so there you go uh you could finally add it to our resume but not so fast uh not too fast so jokes aside we have to uh learn first what a what a server is we did the hello world, but now we're gonna we're gonna dig uh, into details. So a, a server, you you might have heard uh, different uh, you know uses of the word server. Uh, it could be the hardware that 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 you know that that's running twenty four seven to host something, uh, or it could be someone's really powerful PC that that that's connected to a lot of computers. It's like the this this main controller computer. Uh, it, it could be true, Th those definitions could be right, but here we're focusing on, on the server uh, software used in web, which we also call the backend. So what is the backend then? Let me actually maximize this, we're not doing code yet. So what, what is the, the backend? The, the backend is responsible for a lot of things, uh, database, maybe an email server, SSH server, file network a lot of security uh, configuration stuff uh deployment uh, configuration and things like that but the minimum the minimum uh, requirement that we need for a server for web is that it should it, it should be able to understand urls and http protocol it needs that because it has to be able to receive and process a web client's request and it needs to be able to send a response to a client so that's the server part and now what is the client? So a client can be anything that can understand URL and HTTP. Uh, the, same, the same way, it has to be able to, on the other side, request, uh, send a request to the server, and it needs to be able to receive and process a response. So all of these little uh, cute images, uh, whatever those represents, you know, your, your laptop, your, your phone, uh, you could be running a, 
curl or, or a PowerShell, uh, Postman, could be another server, it could be a script running in your browser. So all of those things could, can be clients. The most common client is a browser. And the special thing about a browser is that it can display HTML. So for example, I can go to autodesk.com and I can see this nice HTML with images and there's some style sheets in here for sure. Uh, compared to if you just do curl, I encourage you to try this. So just do curl uh, in you know, the Autodesk website. Actually, let's try that now. Oops. And okay, that didn't. I'll just type it. So yeah, it, you still get a response, right? But then you can't really uh, see the HTML because it's not processed. So that that's the special thing with a with a browser. Uh, in curl, in your in the in the terminal, you can do anything HTTP, but all of the uh, response is displayed as uh, as a text, so it, you know you can't really interpret it. Uh, HTML, you can interpret HTML. Uh, you know you could have gadgets at home; they could be HTTP uh, clients now. To if you have a smart TV, you have you might have Netflix in there. It it just serves as a client to you know to to the Netflix server or or a car or or your 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 console uh, games all of that. So those are example of clients. Uh, in technical terms, we also call these clients user agents, uh, but, but we're going to find out about that later, but that's the technical term. And now let's see the client server architecture. Right, so now that we know what client, what a client and what a server is, this is like the bigger picture. So these are, are these are the your clients. They send a request to the server. The request could be get, post, put, or delete. We're going to find out about those uh, verbs later. But just r right now, uh, just imagine it's sending a sending a request and closing a nice envelope like that. And then the server responds with, with data that these clients can interpret. If it's a browser and it's an HTML response, then the browser can show the HTML uh, nicely. Uh, another special thing with this architecture is it's stateless. The, the client in the server doesn't know how the other is implemented. The client doesn't know or doesn't care if the server is implemented in Node or Rails or, or Python. Same thing, the server doesn't care if the client is implemented in, 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 in plain JavaScript or it's using React or Angular. None of that. They communicate by messages. And as long as those messages conform to a standard, then they can understand each other. So that's that. It's continuing on the concept of server. So a server has basically two functions. I'm over probably oversimplifying this, but they they basically serve two functions. One is as a web server, and one is a, as, as as a REST API. So I'm talking about these modern browsers that are modern servers nowadays. So a web server is is that function that serves the web pages. So like here, if I go to Autodesk and, and I request that I request that page, it would send a request somewhere uh somewhere uh you know in the Autodesk server and then the Autodesk, Autodesk server responds with HTML and all, all of these graphics and the CSS needed to display this page. Uh so, or if you're just in in your mobile or or, or mobile browser, you, you could do the same. You could go to a website and the server responds to the HTML that you can see in your phone. Uh, a very basic example of this is it, it like like here in Autodesk uh, in this Autodesk uh, web page, you could click around. Those are like links. So if I hover something, you could. It's very small that you could see in the in the bottom left that there's a link. So that that's a different page if I click there. So if I click there, it's gonna go to that page. 
or technically it's going to send a request for that page and then the server would send the HTML for that page that I just clicked. So same thing if I click any of these uh, links or here. Uh, so yeah, that, that's for the uh, web server. So it's serving uh, HTML and uh, static stuff like images, uh, JavaScript, uh, CSS. And then there's a REST API uh, function of a server that provides CRUD uh, functionality over HTTP. So what is CRUD? It is uh, Create, Read, Update, and Delete. It's just an acronym. So that means it, it allows, it allows uh, resources or things simply in the server to be manipulated via commands. Uh, we're gonna discuss this in detail in, in, in the next chapter, but just right now you could kind of assume like what we did in our little exercise here, that we were able to send a curl, curl command. Uh, actually, this is not a REST API because we requested a web page, uh, but uh, the REST API you could send, let's say curl uh, post, something to a server. So the server would then would then process that request and then would, would respond with a with, with a message. But the response is not HTML. So I guess that's the main main difference. For for a web for a web server, the server responds with, with HTML. For a REST API, the server responds with a, with data, it could be JSON or XML. Uh, local server setup. So when when we start uh, developing our server, it's gonna run on port four thousand. Let's keep that in mind. So you could do curl local four thousand. Uh, I have a little checkpoint here. I put these little checkpoints to remind me to ask questions. But uh, since right now it's online, just feel free to ask questions as as you as you encounter them while I go through the material. Uh, Right, so uh, I'm gonna start with a little side note here for ES6. So ES6 introduced uh, constant lets. Uh, if you haven't heard of ES6, it's this new, new-ish standard for JavaScript that introduced new syntax, uh, new ways to, to do asynchronous programming and all that. And one of the main uh, things that got delivered from that update is the constant let, which are, which are block scoped, block -scoped uh, variants of the, the var that you, you might have uh, known. And this is an example here. So you have var just in a global scope. If you go inside this, this block, uh, this since const is block scoped, the, the context of, of const is, is restricted inside this block. So when you go outside of that, you go back to the, the global uh, variable again. And the only difference between const and let is, const, is for constant. And let is for dynamic values if, if you plan to change the value of the variable later. Another one, template literals, we're gonna use it a lot here. Uh, you might have done in the past something like this uh, to concatenate strings, you use the plus sign. So in ES6, you could just enclose them with a backtick. So take a note, that's a, that's a backtick uh, in your keyboard, somewhere in the top left uh, of your keyboard. And then you enclose your variables with a dollar sign and uh, open and close brackets. So they have the same result, but this, they have the same result, but this one is a bit more, you know, it's a bit more elegant. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna start with our hello world server. It's just plain node for now. We're not using express yet. So, so let's try this out. So I'm going, All right. Every time I split the, those two windows, it uh, kind of messes up the sizing. So, okay. Sorry about that. All right, that's a little bit better. If you find a hard time uh, seeing what, whatever's on the right side, uh, just try to take a note of, of where I am in terms of the, the chapter, and then you can look at it uh, from your side. Uh, all right, so let's check out this chapter. Git checkout dash FC 1.1. 1. 
once again, tell me if the VS, VS Code uh, font is, is good enough for, for your screen. Maybe it's too small. Uh, so yeah, so we have that here. What we're doing here is, so we have this server.js file, that's where our server goes. What we're doing here is we're just importing uh, a built-in node package, HTTP, and then when we're creating a server with that, with that, with that package, create server, and what happens is that after the server is created, we want this function to be executed, which is called a, a callback function. So that's one thing that you're gonna see a lot in, in nodes and in JavaScript in general, is that you have these asynchronous stuff going on that you have to pass a callback uh, for you to do what you wanna do. So here, in the, inside that callback, once the server is created, we, we respond with a 200, that means it's okay. It's a good response with a content type uh, text, the plain text. And this is the actual response that we're sending, hello world. So that's the server creation. And this is the part where we listen, uh, where the server starts uh, listening for clients. So here we just declared a, a port number, 4,000. Once, once the server starts listening, we also pass a callback function here that would just uh, print this statement server listening at that port. So let's let's try that out. Server.js. So now we're listening at 4,000. So for us to be able to test that, we could, uh, one thing is that we could go open another browser here. Okay, I have a lot there. Let me close those everything. And then you could just go to localhost 4000. And then you get that, that hello world. Right, so that's one way to test. Uh, let me see if I have some notes here. Yeah, so the nice thing with, uh, with, uh, with modern browsers nowadays is that you could, you could inspect what, what's happening in the network. So you could open your dev tools. Uh, for me, I could just do F12 to open my dev tools. For, if it doesn't work for you, you could right click and then inspect. And then it's gonna open your dev tool somewhere. What we really wanna see here is the network tab. Right, so, so we have to re, we have to reload to request it again. So this is what we're interested, uh, localhost 200. So we can see here that the server responded with an okay, that it's a good response. Uh, here we can see the content type sent by our server, which is exactly what we did here on the left side. And then I think that's it. That's what I wanted to show. Oh, actually the content type. Yeah, it's the content types there. Cool. Uh, you could also test this from your curl. So going back to the to VS Code, I'm gonna send a curl to that. URL, so we also get uh, hello world. So you could test it both in a browser and in curl. They're both acting as clients. Uh, yeah, so discuss that. So like I said before, you could add terminals here so that one terminal for you is the browser that is running, and then the other terminal, if you add one, that's gonna be where you do uh, your, your client stuff like curl. And then I suggest doing another one for, for Git. So you have three of these. I post this one, so I want three, three of them. Uh, all right, so that's that. That's for that, for the uh, sample hello world. Uh, a little side note here again about ESX arrow functions, because we're gonna see them next. So if you're seeing it for the first time, uh, it really looks weird. That, that's how I felt also. First time I saw it, uh, it looks a bit weird. Uh, so that's how we used to write functions in ES5. This is a function expression. So function and then the name of the function and then you know the rest of the function. And then there's function definition. You could assign it to a variable. Uh, 
So in ES6, you could you could write this uh, both of these like 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 this. So you could do const add, then that. Uh, so the function keyword is gone, and then you put a, a little uh, arrow there. They call it a fat arrow, uh, but it's really just an equal sign and uh, a greater than sign smashed together, and that's the rest of your function. And then there's an e uh, well, the equals actually stays the same. So if you know a lot about JavaScript, uh, a little uh, notes that only the function expression here is hoisted. The other ones are are hoisted, uh, are are not hoisted, meaning you can't use them uh, before declaration. And the thing with our functions, you're gonna see it a lot. That's why I want to include it here. You're gonna see this a lot online. When you see ES6 code online, they they use a lot of shorthands. We actually do too. Uh, for, for the code base in in my team, uh, if you only have uh, one line of code, we call it a one-liner. You you could omit the return, so you could just have that. It's implied, and you could even make it sh shorter. That if you only have one parameter for your function, you could even eliminate the parentheses. So so really shorthand. I know it looks really weird, but it it takes it takes some time to get used to. I just want you to be familiar with the with the with the syntax. Uh, so yeah, so sending text, you know, it's pretty boring, right? We're we're gonna we're gonna send something else. Let's try to send JSON data. So what I do here on my VS Code is I stop the server, and then where's my Git? Yeah, Git check out. This is one point two. Yeah, 1.2. Then I go back to my uh, node server. Node server. But I mean, if if you haven't used, uh, if you're not used to a terminal, you could just do up arrow, down arrow to go through commands. Uh, that's a nice little tip there. So now it's listening. We could go back to localhost per thousand. And now we get this nice JSON data, and we inspect that here. We confirm that it's uh, content type application JSON. Cool. When you start to uh, explore the network tab, you might get a lot of things here on this side. So try to ignore the other stuff for now. So just look at what resembles your URL closely. In this case is local host for thousand, so that's the one that we're looking for. The other stuff, uh, you know, are, are are don't worry about them for now. So, just to take a closer look at our code here. So we have uh, JSON stringify here that serializes this this object. But first of all, this object. Uh, if you're not too familiar with with JavaScript objects, this this is this is a JavaScript object. It's in a in a key value pair. So this is a key, and that's the value. That's a key. That's the value. Uh, and, and and they're called attributes or properties, and you could group them uh, with each other with with a bracket. So this here is is an object, and then we assign that to a variable, and then. When you have an object, you could access the the things inside with with a dot like this. So song that title, song that artist. So that should give a song that title, which is this one. And then saying song that artist is this one. But in our case, we want to send that to the client because we're in the server side. So first, we have to we have to send uh, the head of the response, which with two hundred like before. So it's okay, and application json content type to make to to signify that we're sending json data and then to actually send it uh we, we use end like we used before i think we have rest.end or rest.send uh the pretty much the same uh but then here we like i said we have to stringify because we can't send a plain object through the network we, we have to serialize it so oh so this is how we serialize it 
what JSON stringify does it, is it would convert this to something like like this, right? Like a like a like a string that you could send safely over the network. Uh, that's for the JSON. JavaScript objects, like I like I mentioned. Uh, we could also try that in curl. So let's switch to uh, our terminal there, and we could try it again. So now we're getting that JSON data there. Cool. Uh, so uh, a little like meme here on why why JSON, why we use JSON. The the whole joke here is that look look at how small the JSON data is compared to the XML version. And yeah, so that's the punchline. Uh, why why do we use JSON? There, there you go. A uh, small checkpoint here. Actually, I'm gonna check the the YouTube uh, stream in case there's any questions there. All right, cool. So it, it looks like it's been taken care of. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm gonna go back. So if there's any burning questions, uh, make sure to post it in Slack. So I may not look at the YouTube often. So cool, we're sending a JSON. How about sending HTML? So for this one, we pretty much the same. We set the content type to text HTML, and we just send an HTML string. So let me try that. Stop the server, control C, uh, git checkout 1.3. So now we have a, we got that code. Let's start the server again. And Let's try it in our test browser. Cool. So we got that that one, and if we check the network, now we're getting HTML, text HTML. So from plain text to JSON to HTML, so we're we're improving a bit. And of course, like before, you could always test that uh, with. Uh, I got a question from Quinn. Is it important to stop and restart the server before and after new modifications? Not not all the time. So actually, it's not it's not it's not it's not mandatory. Uh, although sometimes when you switch to a, a branch too far, th then then you might have to restart. Uh, for for now, yeah. Actually, for now, yes, you, you have to stop and restart the server. Because we're not using node mon yet node mon yet. Uh, let me respond to that. That part install. Right now we have to manually stop uh, and restart because the changes are not gonna be applied. Uh, but once we have node mon and, and we have npm, uh, you would have to restart it less. Uh, so continuing, servers don't usually send play, plain HTML strings like this, right? It's kind of boring. Uh, who who really does send an HTML like that? Usually we have a file, uh, an actual HTML file that we send. Uh, so how how do we do that? How do we send an HTML file? Uh, this is where this is where npm and express comes in. Uh, Node is a little kind of low level by itself. You could do a lot of powerful stuff in Node. But if, if you want to do web server stuff, there's a lot of frameworks out there to simplify just the web server stuff. Uh, one of them is Express, which is uh, very popular. Uh, but for us to install Express, we need to have uh, NPM. NPM com comes with Node. It's a package registry and package manager. Uh, and how we do that is we just uh, initialize our NPM. Here, so you do npm init y, and then after that we could finally install uh, stuff. After you do the, the init, actually, uh, I invite you to take a look at your package.json, because when you have the package.json, that that's the that's the key there that you finally have npm working, and after you have that, you could install things. So here we're going to install Express. While that installing uh, it might take a while. Uh, 
the dependency stuff would the dependencies key, sorry, in the package.json would contain all of your installed libraries. And then the scripts, uh, you could define scripts here that you can run, like npm start, for example. And then you put here whatever you want to do when you type npm start. So it's kind of like an alias uh, command uh, thing. So here we just keep the default. Uh, node server.js so when we do on my on my terminal here when we do npm start it would actually call node server.js oh i got some oh sorry i i, I already have my server running see th that's why we had to stop the server first uh so now instead of doing node server.js we could do npm start and it would do the same thing so the nice thing with this is you could add a lot of scripts here, like here you could, you have tests, you have uh, you could add all sorts of st all sorts of stuff. I think just in a in our code base we have probably like twenty five scripts here. Uh, for the script dependencies, node modules. So very important note: once you have npm uh, set up and you install the package, you're gonna have a uh, a little folder here, node modules, but it's actually not so little. Uh, if you try to explore it, it it's a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, you can actually get lost in there. It uh, it contains all the installed packages that you have for your current project in your local machine. So there's a little meme here to really drive the point when you have node modules and you forget to get ignore it. So GitHub would just be cluttered would be defeated by all the node modules of of, uh, of all the, the devs uh, local uh, installed packages. So how we do that is we have a dot git ignore file. If you know git, you already know what I'm talking about, uh, the git ignore. So anything you don't want to be pushed to the, the repository, you put here. So we put node modules here, very important. Because if not, once you push your code to GitHub, it would push all your, your node modules, which would not only take a long time, it would also clutter your, your, your repo very fast. So right now we have this directory structure. Uh, so the most important thing right now is the server.js because that's our actual server code. That's where it's running. That's where our, 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 our logic is for responding to the clients. Express, oh, so let's start with Express. Let me just uh, grab a little bit of water. So Express is, it's a, lab, it's a framework actually. It's a framework from Node that is super popular. You could use it for middleware and routing. Don't worry about what those uh, mean right now, but uh, the most important thing is the routing. Uh, so the routing and uh, yeah, so actually I'll explain it really quick. Uh, middleware have access to your request and response object. So if you look on, on, on the left side in my, in, my, in my code, you have these uh, request and response object that is passed uh, to the callback. So middleware uh, functions like 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 Express or middleware frameworks have access to those, and they help you manipulate those those objects. And how it does that is, uh, yeah, it's abstracting between nodes, uh, low level HTTP and in, in our code, so it's just easier for us. Because if you you actually don't want to, uh, especially if you're starting in Node, you don't want to go straight to the to the low level HTTP stuff. It's actually quite, it's a lot of stuff, uh, especially the, the strings and things like that. So let's talk about routing. Uh, routing uh, has a lot of uh, usage in, in, in IT, but I think it always comes down to this concept of, of kind of like a, a routes or, or like in real life, you have, a, you, have this, you have this destination and then uh for you to reach that destination you have this this declared uh path right so that's how routes also work uh routing the 
the official uh, definition routing is how the server interprets the URLs on, on client requests and direct them to the functionality. So you have routes and route handler. So for example, here, oh, I hate when it does that. All right. So for example, here you have a route uh, slash. So whenever the client goes to slash, uh, you, you, you execute this function in the route handler. So the route handler is that, that is that callback that, that we have seen before that handles that route. So quick syntax, that's how you declare a route in Express. So you do the verb, so dot get, dot post. Uh, and then you have the route there, which is the, you know, the description on the path that you want to match from the client. And then what, what do you want to do with that, uh, with that request? Uh, before we talk about the routes, we should actually talk about the URLs quickly. So we've been using this, uh, you know, URL localhost 4000, but what is what does it really mean? Uh, so the HTTP part is your protocol. It, it's implicit, you know, if you go to a website, if you if you do Google.com, you don't have to put HTTP because it's it gets uh, implied. Uh, your browser takes care of that. Uh, but if you use HTTPS, then you have to put it uh, directly. But when you use curl, for example, you have to put the, the protocol. Yeah, the domain here is localhost. Uh, that's just for local uh, development. When our server is deployed to the cloud, you're going to have a, a domain and subdomain and things like that if you want to buy a domain. And then we have the port uh, 4000 for just for local development. Uh, Again, if when it gets deployed later to the cloud, it's gonna be on default default 80, which doesn't really show. So when you go to websites like Autodesk, you don't see a, a, a you know a dash 80 there because it's it's by default. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That's the port. You could change it as you wish. Just uh, there's a list of ports uh, that you can't use. So uh, just make sure you don't use those. Uh, and this is the most important part, the paths that I was talking about before. You have slash and slash JSON. So we're going to see this a lot in routing. Uh, but uh, the, the, key, the key thing here to remember is that these paths give, give away what, what, what we want to do, what we actually request from the server. We could put options here. We could put... Uh, parameters here to really describe, okay, server, he says, this is what I want to do. And uh, to demonstrate that, let's uh, let's do some HTML routing. Uh, sorry, I whenever I split the screen, it, it just goes back. Uh, oh, that's where we are. So, Let's just check the code out. I'm gonna stop my server here. All right, seems like my server stuck. Okay, yeah, it's stuck. So if ever your, your terminal gets stuck like this, like it doesn't respond to controls, you just, you could kill the terminal there and just recreate a new one. All right, so I have my git here, so g1.5. And we just added an HTML here, nothing fancy. It's just a HTML with a few styles. Uh, and from our server, this is the uh, this is the exciting part here. That now we have now we have these routes because because we're using Express now. So uh, I'm gonna explain this uh, really quick. So we have now we have Express. We require it. You, we import the Express using require, uh, and then we actually create a, a server instance with that Express. And then what we can do with that server instance is that we could now set up our routes. Like here, I'm setting a, a route such that when user goes to to slash, they uh, we send uh, index.html. And same thing here. When the when the client goes to slash JSON, we send this JSON uh, data right here, and same thing before with the listen, we didn't change anything. 
uh, little side note with send file and send that we uh, whenever we do this the remember the head before that, that we're 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 writing the head and then we're setting the status to 200 for for these for this it's already set automatically same thing with the content type we don't have to to do content type here because express automatically uh, uh, includes that because we're attaching HTML another thing is the dear name uh, this is a global object in nodes that signifies the uh, where the directory of where the current file is running so here here's actually pretty important because from inside this file we don't know where index.html is located so they're in the same directory but we still have to do this to to be explicit about it so wherever this file is uh no oh, sorry wherever the uh yeah the directory of this file where it's located just attach uh index html to that so your server can can locate it and send it to the client so simply put slash render index.html slash json uh send uh a json data like that so let's try it out Start. All right, so now it's listening. So if we go to 4000, cool. So now we have an HTML and file, HTML file, and we know that it's working because we have the style set up just like that. Uh, things like not working. Oh, weird. Okay. All right, my uh, oh, there we go. It hesitated to open for for a bit there. So, so localhost. Uh, we're sending a two hundred OK. Uh, we're sending the content type somewhere. It's HTML. And we also have the car set there, which came from the HTML, and yeah, and then let's try the JSON route then. Slash JSON. Cool, so now we're receiving this uh, JSON. By the way, if it displays weirdly on, on your machine, uh, the JSON, it's okay, don't worry about it. It's just I have an extension that displays it nicely. Uh, so here, uh, okay, content type. It's still HTML. Hmm. Because we're in a browser, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's weird. But let's try from curl. Curl. I'm getting my terminals mixed up now. Actually, let's just copy that. Curl. Jason. All right. Yeah. Anyways, we're we're gonna figure that out after why it's still sending HTML as a content type. I think it's because we're we're just letting uh we're just letting Express decide and it just uh, assumes for itself. Which works for HTML but for JSON weirdly it doesn't. So uh that's how you try the codes and that's how you try those with, with curl. Uh, auto restart, as as Quinn mentioned before, uh, you know, do we have to stop and restart the server uh, every time? Uh, after this, not anymore because we're gonna use this thing called Node Mon, but you have to install it first. Uh, so we're gonna install that. So what Node Mon does is it it's gonna watch watch your your server files, and whenever it changes, it would restart the server automatically. And while that's installing. We're gonna put that also in our in our scripts. So instead of node server.js, we're gonna put node mon. So we're sure that it's uh, it's using node mon to to watch the files. So while that's running, uh, let's move on to this one. So adding new routes. Uh, here is just a, another example on how we add routes. We're gonna do this route slash page slash products. We send HTML and then we have slash products to send uh, the JSON. 
Uh, here we're separating the HTML route with a slash page just to kind of like keep it simple for now. You're gonna see more of that in, in the later chapters. So you had this uh, products.html, simple, nothing fancy. And we're gonna add, we're gonna add these routes that you see from the right side. Same thing, uh, HTML, their name. Uh, we're, sen we're sending the, these JSON data, uh, but instead of sending one item, we're sending two items. So it's still the same, just have to make sure that uh, you JSON stringify it, right? So, so now that no mod node mods uh, finished, you could finally uh, test it out. NPM start. So now that we have Nodemon, uh, I'm gonna put just a sample. Uh, so as you can see, any change that I do to the server, it's gonna it's gonna restart. Uh, and we just want to test that those last few bits that that we that we added the page products and products page products. Oops. Oh yeah, we didn't pull the the branch yet. So actually, we'll, since we have Nodemon, I think you could just get away with uh, with checking out the files. So we where are we? One point seven. One point seven. And it would actually restart. See. And uh, we got all our files here, and that should work now. Perfect. So that worked. And let's try the JSON one products. All right, so that works. Perfect. Uh, this is a little checkpoint before the activity, but uh, you know, if you have any questions, just just ask on Slack. Uh, we're gonna have our first activity here. I'm gonna rest my voice too for a little bit. Uh, useful tip while you're doing the activity. Uh, just duplicate the tab. As you can see here, you could right click it and duplicate tab. So you could have one tab for the activity and another tab maybe if you wanna go back through the material while, while you're trying to solve the activity. Uh, but first thing, first things first, before you start, make sure you check out the activity branch. You could check out dash FC1 challenge. And here you, you're gonna add uh, two routes, uh, one for HTML, so make sure you add it in that in that route, and you're gonna add a new foods slash foods route, and just send this JSON, uh, kind of like what we did before, but uh, you know I, I'll let you I'll let you do it, and uh, this is how you test it. So if there's anything not clear or you're having a hard time, uh, send me a message on Slack. All right, so. I'll see you in, uh, I think I'll give you 10 minutes for this. See you in 10 minutes.
Alright, welcome back. Uh, by the way, I have my my window open, so I might be catching some background noise. If it's if it's too much, if it's if it's uh, adding a lot of noise to the audio, let me know. I'm gonna close it. But it's it's a little it's a little warm. It's a little hot, hot in my room if I don't have it open. All right. So uh, thanks for uh, participating in the activity. Glad we did it. Uh, I forgot to mention, you know, th these activities are, are there, there's no pressure, you know, uh, if some of you might may be seeing this for the first time, so you, you might you might still be trying to understand stuff. So that's why I give you the 15 minutes to really digest the material, understand it, ask questions. Uh, for those of you who are who were able to follow, uh, you know, you could you could try the, the activity. Uh, and for those of you who really probably have used Node before, maybe you even did advanced, uh, you know, so there's there's no competition here, there's no contest. Uh, so it's really just there to, you know, if, if you want to do it, it's it kind of helps you uh, solidify the knowledge. Uh, so a little recap. Uh, actually, I'm going to see the, let's look at the solutions. Sorry for all the scrolling. Let's look at solutions here quickly. So this is where I love the GitHub features for, for, for comparing code. So I could compare the solution and the challenge. Uh, but yeah, I also shared the solution in, in the activity. So some of you may have seen this already, but just to go through, uh, so we added the about HTML here, you know, just, uh, oh, wow, it's just a very small one. Okay, wow, sorry about that. Oh yeah, that should probably be better. We added an HTML page, uh, basic stuff. Uh, but here we we establish a new route in slash page slash about, and then we sent the uh, HTML that one. And then here we have another route, a JSON route, and then we just sent the uh, JSON stringified uh, version. Uh, sorry, JSON stringified uh, data right there. Uh, uh, someone asked in Slack uh, about if we if we always need to do this. Uh, I believe so. We have to do this when we use send, but we're gonna see a way later to that we don't have to do that stringify. Uh, and that's it. Uh, the solutions in advance are in the challenge, so you've probably seen that already. Quick recap. So we discussed. In chapter one, what is a server? What is a client? The uh, client server architecture, the two main functions, super important to remember that, that distinction. We have a web server that's serving HTML pages and we have a REST API that is serving uh, data. Uh, and we have a, we were able to do a simple node server that returns text, HTML, and then JSON, and a little, uh, a few things about NPM. Uh, what's in that URL and then routing. These are some key takeaways. But uh, we're going to have new syntaxes uh, in the next chapter. So let's get started. All right. So we're in. Okay, perfect. We're in chapter two, uh, building a REST API. So uh, in chapter one, we kind of touched on REST API a bit, but now we're going to discuss it in detail. But first of all, what is really a REST API? Uh, so there's 
two acronyms there, which is kind of daunting if you're hearing it for the first time. Uh, the first acronym is the API part. So let's let's talk about that first. So basically an API, uh, kind of in my own words, so, uh, you know, this is how I understand it, although you would find a lot of other definitions. Uh, it is how two pieces of code communicate to each other. Uh, the definition of API is application programming interface. And note the keyword there, program, programming interface. So it's for program programs compared to a, a user interface, which is a, a UI, which is for users. So your, your user interface could be anything with uh, buttons, forms, uh, text boxes, all those shiny stuff in the front end. But the, in terms of the API, there's nothing like shiny about it. It's all, uh, you know, plain text. It's like computers talking to each other, uh, two pieces of code talking to each other. They, they, they don't need visual stuff. It's all, it's all, you know, it's all code. Uh, you may have used APIs before. Uh, some of you have, have, you know, probably gone to a hackathon and then there's these companies offering their API. Oh, here, let's, uh, you know, use our API. Uh, so that's their API. So that means you could, you could, you could use their, their the API, but uh, on their side, they have a lot of functionality in in, in those in in, uh, in those libraries, right? Those those companies that that offer API, but they're only exposing a, a part of that functionality uh, to you uh, in the form of an API. So that's the keyword there. That it's it's the exposed set of features because uh, we, uh, you know in in software and when you write code every day, you're gonna have uh, parts of your code that you don't you don't need the users of that code to know. So that's why you have an API. So I have a really quick example here. You're writing a class dog that has a bark and eat function. So you don't need the users or the user don't need to know how the bark and eat is implemented. The user just wants the dog to bark. So they would call dog that bark after they create a, a dog object. So the API of, of, of the, the dog class is the bark and eat. So those are the methods that support it that you can call as the user of, uh, no, the user here is as the, as the developer. So you're using that code. Uh, other examples, you know, Node and Express has a really good API. Uh, you could, uh, uh, let's see, let's see quickly. This is the API for Express. It really explain, explains to you you know how to use uh, send, JSON, request response, all that. So it's very well documented. That's a, a key feature of an API. It has to be well documented so you can use it without having to look at the source code. Because imagine looking at the source code of, of Express or Node to use to use Node. Uh, so that kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, you may have you may have gadgets, Fitbit, a VR headset, Leap Motion. Uh, your game consoles. I'm sure they have some sort of API that you could integrate. You know, you could do some nice, uh, nice uh, hacks with that. Google, Facebook, Twitter, Spotify, they all have APIs. Uh, your operating system has an exposed API to you, so you could configure it through the terminal, so you don't have to look at, at Windows or Mac's source code for you to be able to uh, display the time, for example, or, or print the time. So things like that. Uh, so that's the API part. And then the REST part, uh, REST stands for representational state transfer. It's this architecture for building uh, web services which with HTTP and resources. So the keyword here is a, is a resource, resource. So anything can be a resource uh, according to REST. It could be a book, a user, a food, a pet, a person, anything. Anything that can be a noun, so that's your noun, the resource. And these these nouns can be manipulated by verbs, which are the HTTP methods: get, post, delete, put, all of that. And and the nice thing is is you can kind of oversimplify it to sentences, verb plus noun. So you have get foods, so which means get all the foods from the server. Post, or AKA creates uh, a new user in the server delete uh, a blog from the, from the server. So, so that, that's, that's the whole point of REST API is that you, know, you have a standard set of methods and, and, and protocols to allow the manipulation of resources on the server 
via uh, stateless messages. We're going to see examples of that very shortly. Uh, there's this thing uh, called JSON placeholder. It's one of those fake APIs. Uh, if you've never used fake APIs, th these are these are uh, deployed uh, services, uh, deployed servers online, and then you know we could just uh, test them out, and then they would they always respond some some sort of data. So like that, we could also test it in, in curl. But what I wanted uh, to show here is that uh, these are GET requests. You know, here we're getting the first uh, post, sorry, the, the post with an ID one. So when we run that in our browser, okay, so it returns the, the post with an ID one right there. And here, here, as you can guess, we're, we're getting the comments of the post with an ID one. So let's try that. So that's all the comments. So that's an array of comments from that post with ID one. And then you could go even further the comment with an ID one from the group of comments from post with an ID one. Uh, that's a mouthful, but you, you know what I mean, right? Like you're, you're, you're getting the, the first post and then from there you're getting the comments and then you're getting the ID from that. So that's what REST allows you to do to, it's kind of a language, if you may, for you to locate resources and make requests. Uh, the fourth one is just similar to the the first one. It serves the same purpose. It's just uh, it's expressed differently. We're gonna see that difference later. But this one is uh, using a query string parameter. It's more kind of explicit, right? ID equals one compared to this one. It's using the it's using the route parameter, just as that one. And these things, uh, and whenever you use a public API, it really depends. It really depends on on uh, on how they implement it. So always look at documentations on on how they want you as the user to make requests. We could do a post request. Uh, a post in REST is usually used for creating a resource. So actually, I'm gonna go to my curl now. To my terminal. Because the thing with the browser is it's a lot harder, or it's actually not possible for us to make a requests other than other than get, right? So we have to do that in 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 the in the terminal. So let's try that here. Gee, this one near that. So we're sending we're sending this data because we want this post. It, Let's say it's a blog post. Let's say this blog post to be created on the server, and here we have to specify, you know, what content type are we sending? Dash H, and this is the data that we're sending using dash D. So content type uh, using a header. So dash H is a header, capital H, and then dash D is the data, and then that's the URL or the endpoint. Uh, so that works. Uh, and by the way, those uh, backslash markers allow us to split the command into multiple lines. So it's kind of neat. Uh, put is usually used for editing a resource. So in this case, as you can see, compared to the post, the post we didn't identify a specific post. We're just saying, OK, post this, uh, this thing to all the posts. But for, for put or for editing, we have to specify which post we want to edit. So that's why we're passing a one there. And the data that we're passing is the, uh, the attributes that we want to be edited on, on that particular post. So same thing, we're passing a, a JSON uh, data. And then, you know, like before, we have to enclose it in, in, a, in a nice string. That's why when when we did the server before, we had to JSON stringify it. If you had to do it manually, this is what it looks like. Uh, so that works too. And lastly, you can do delete. Uh, you can do delete like that. Let's say you want to delete the post with ID 101. So you just send that. 
it doesn't really uh, it's just a simulation right it's a fake API but it allows us to to do, see that uh, so as you can see uh, the verb that, that we the verbs that we use we have get post put and delete we specify that in curl with a dash X right so we we add dash X except for get because get it's it's implied if we don't pass a, a, a verb so make sure you pass pass that dash x and then the verb uh, get is for fetching resource kind of like a read only thing post is for creating a new res resource put is for updating a resource specified by id and delete is for deleting a resource specified by id uh, these are the defaults in practice you're going to see a lot of variations uh, rest is not you know some some uh, services follow REST. So some of them they don't strictly follow REST. It's not a, it's not mandatory to follow it, but it kind of just uh, gives you a good guideline. A little side note here: uh, difference between GET and POST. So whenever you use GET, uh, it goes to the URL here, right? Uh, so let's say you have a lot of parameters here, like name equals Lenny, and da da da. Uh, so it gets exposed in the URL visible to kind of expose to the public. The difference with post is that whenever you have a post uh, a post route in your server, it's hidden in the request body, as we're gonna see later. So there's a kind of a security aspect there. The headers, I'm gonna touch on this uh, quickly, but you could add a header like uh, we, we've seen before. You could have a here, oh, sorry. You can have a header content type application JSON. So content type is, the data type that is being sent by the client, uh, right? So you could have these values. We've seen some of these before in chapter one. And the accept header is the data type that the client wants from the server. So a content type is, is the data being sent by the client and accept is the data type that the client wants back from the server. Uh, the thing with accept is it's usually set uh, automatically by by browser or even curl. So we could inspect this thing quickly for curl, for example. So we add dash v to see the the request headers. Uh, that's a lot of details. But yeah, see here, curl added that. But if we add our own, it's also going to work. The thing is, the thing with accept is the the server doesn't necessarily have to, to, to follow it. The accept is kind of just a suggestion. Uh, they could, if you say accept equals JSON, the server could still send you HTML. But you know, in good REST practices, the server has to follow it. Uh, and if you do that, the same thing in, uh, in the browser, you could also see the, it's not tax, they don't probably support that. You can see the accept header here. Uh, we send it. You can see the da, 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 da. request header. We're looking for a request header. Uh, accept. So that's that long, 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 long uh, string specifies what browser accepts. I think there's a little bit of difference between you know which browser you use, but basically a browser accepts HTML, but you know like in this case the server still sent JSON. So <laughs> paths, uh, we discuss a little bit about the paths later, but let's touch on the the parameters part of the paths. I won't discuss. The other ones in detail. Uh, what I want to really show is this one. This one we're going to use a lot. So here, uh, the the pink part, that's your resource, right? That's the noun. Could be posts, could be pets, books, anything that that your website is all about. Uh, and and here, if you just if you have a route that that just has slash posts. It's uh, it means get get me everything for for the get request. Uh, that's what it usually means. And then if you have if you start to have request parameters, then you start to add to specify which one you want. Like here, 
post slash one, you know, get the post with ID one. And, you know, like we discussed before, if you put comments, then comments slash one, then you, you go you go inside that object. Uh, query string is what follows after the, the question mark. This is your chance to pass even more details. But then again, this is very specific to the server. This is the part that you have to really check the documentation. Okay, what parameters do you do you support? Like in this case, uh, JSON uh, typeico.com supports uh, user ID, I think. Let's see. Cross fingers, okay, it, it actually supports it. See, it returned just the user ID too. But it really depends on the server. I had to test around. But if you see that 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 syntax, that's a query string. And now that we know how to make a request, so that's from the client side. This is how you make a request. How do we read that request from the express side, from our server side? So we have these two values, rec. Uh, I'm gonna just say rec, but maybe it's req. But rec that params and rec that query. These take the values from your URL, from your request parameter and, and from your string query values, and then they put it in these objects so that you can access it in your code. So for example, you have this route. For now, just imagine these, this, these things as variables. So that's, that's a, an ID and a key that would be filled by, by the client request. So you have that route and then the user, the client, sends a request on post slash one slash comments. So automatically, if you have this route defined in your server, ID becomes one, like this thing, and then the key becomes the comments. So inside your route handler, you have uh, access to, to this object and then you could use it. Uh, these are some examples on how it's mapped, but uh, as you can see here, you have slash one. If the user goes to slash one, ID becomes one, and then from your code, you can get that ID, whatever that ID that the user passed using rec that parms that ID. And if you have, if you name it like colon name, then it's gonna be rec that parms that name and so on. And you could refer to this for more complicated stuff, but uh, I think that's what we need for now. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the paths, the request body. Uh, it's pretty much straightforward. Just just pass a, a request body when you're doing a post input request, and you do that with a dash d, uh, lowercase d in, in curl. Uh, you know you don't really pass a request body when you're doing a get because you know it's like a read only request. But when you're doing a post input, you have to pass a, a body because either you want to create a new resource or you want to edit an existing resource. Uh, so we talked about the request. Now we're going to talk about the response. Uh, so normally we uh, uh, we see the response data, you know, when we do the get request from the browser. But uh, yeah, we we did this before. We we checked the. You could also see the response headers there. If you go back there, we saw the. You know, you have request headers here. You have the response header here. You could really. There's a lot of them. And but in curl. Uh, for you to see that, you use dash i. You could also use dash b like we did before, but I think dash i is specific to just show you just the uh, just the response headers without the other clutter. So as you can see here, we got our our, our response and we got these response headers. All of that. Uh, I'm going to talk about just the important stuff, the content type. Uh, as you can see here, content type, where are you? Okay, JSON. This is the content type of the response, which means this is the, the type of the data that the server is sending to you. So sometimes they, they, they respect the, the, the accept, and unfortunately, sometimes they don't. But uh, uh, oh, by, by the way, if you want to see details on the MIME types, they're called MIME types, these, these, uh, these types. You could click this link. Uh, this is this. These are the values that could go into the accept request header or the content type uh, response header. Another really uh, important one is the status. Uh, this is the status whether the request completed or not. The most popular ones are the 200, and as you all know, the 404. 
which uh, is, is now even used in popular culture. Uh, 404, as you know, is if the request is not found, the server responds with a 404. You could simulate that here. So this ex uh, exists, right? So we got a 200 status code. Actually, this is general. You can also see that in the response header. If we scroll down a bit, there you go. Status. That's the official status code. And let's test uh, something that would trigger a 404 slash blah. Blah. All right, so we triggered a 404. You get a nice red thing there. Uh, status 404. Now, most websites have a nicer page rather than showing nothing or showing an error. Uh, like I tagged one here, it's really interesting. Uh, whenever they someone hits a 404, they send uh, they send uh, a thing. Oh, who do you want to fire? Because it's unacceptable. Uh, you're gonna see a lot online. You can actually Google it. Like a really creative 404 pages. Uh, dev the, the the community I'm a part of. They actually provide you with a. It is some nice art there. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. So if you have any questions, post them in Slack. Uh, I'm going to keep going. We're actually a little bit behind on time, but I'm really taking my time to explain. So uh, I hope that that really helps. So now that we understand both the request and response, we could start to build our, our REST API. Uh, but for now, we're going to use uh, some sample data because we're not gonna do the database yet. It's a bit too complicated at this step. So we're gonna use just a JSON file. So we have this JSON file that we're gonna import in our server. So that's how you import, require that JSON file. And then, you know, as a test, we just log the, the first item from that, uh, from that JSON file. And don't forget to include uh, user's JSON in, in your Node1 config, because what happens if you, forget to do it is whenever uh, your client sends a request, like a post or, or a put or delete, then your your, your JSON uh, file uh, changes and then it would trigger a restart and then you kind of get into an infinite loop there. Uh, so let's try that out quickly. I'm a little behind on my branch, so uh, bear with me here. We're in 2.1. Just gonna just to make sure stop my server, but I didn't have to. Right. Uh, that's for my curl. That's for my uh, what did I do here? Oh wow! Well. Start. That's for my curl, and this should be for my git. Six point one. Okay, yeah. So. Should be fine. We have those files there. We have a new file here, users.json. And as a test, we should be seeing that. Okay, so we saw that. So that means it worked. The import worked. Perfect. Uh, now we're actually going to do the REST API. So we're going to start with, uh, with a get users and, oops. So this table that you're seeing here, uh, usually our REST API is well documented. It has to specify which uh, which routes are available and, and what's the expected response. So we're going to see some of that after. But right now, let's uh, sorry, let's try to that too. So now we have. Okay, we're gonna go down a bit because we added a lot of things from the activity. So we have there. So that's your users. So now we don't have to use the JSON stringify. We don't have to serialize it because rest.json does that for us. So here we could directly use our array there, our in-memory array that's imported from the JSON file and we could just return it directly. So here we're basically saying if the client requests slash users, send them the, the users array. That's it. So let's go back to our oh, let me clean up here. Users. Boom. So we got the users. 
so that's what it does. We could also try from curl if you want. Another get uh, request that usually uh, a REST API has is to get a specific uh, item, a specific user in this case. So let's see what that entails. Let me give more space here. So what's happening here, I'm going to uh, point on the left side. So we have this route. And as I mentioned before, this is the variable. So anything you see in the route that has a colon, that, that's a variable. So here we want to get the, the user ID from the client. So that's why we have slash user slash uh, ID variable. And then we have to convert that to a number because usually the, the rect that params uh, stuff is strings. So you have to convert that to a number. And here we use a find. I'm going to give examples of find after, but right now, the only thing it's doing is that it's looking for the user with this ID that we got from the parameters from the array. So remember, this is the, our array, and we imported that. So we're just looking for the one with ID that's passed by the user. If the user is found, we respond with, with, with an error. I'd actually, we should have responded with a status 404 also. I forgot to include that there. And if not, uh, if the user is found, then we just return the user. So how does that look like in practice? Let's try. So let's say I put two. Right, so it returns that user. If four, you're gonna we're gonna get a user that, that user not found. Uh, so quick recap here. That's your route. This is the client's request. Uh, the client's request, whatever is in the uh, uh, route variable, goes to the params. So in this case, if you do one, it becomes one there. So I, I really just want to clarify that because uh, we're going to use that a lot. So you want to test that. Actually, let's test that in curl also. Oh, that's our git. That's our curl. All right, so we got we got. Uh, the response. A uh, little side note: If you haven't used find before, so find is a it's an array function, array method uh, in JavaScript. That let's say you have an array, and then you do find. You, you you pass a function to find that specifies which which item should should be returned. In here, we're just looking for the item that is divisible by two. So if you execute that, you get four. Uh, and find uh, always returns uh, either none if it didn't find anything, or just one value. It finds the first one. And that's how you do it in, in, in ES6. Uh, so yeah, that's a nice nice little method there that we have. And this was the, the API table that I was, uh, actually, I think I could just do this. Ah, oh, it's, it's the same effect. Uh, this is what's the table that I was talking about before. Let me magnify that a bit. So usually, whenever you use an API, uh, they have this this nice table on you know what operation can you do, what method is that, the URL, the parameters, request body, uh, sample. So make sure that if you do your own REST API, make sure you provide something like this in let's say your your GitHub or README. I'm gonna keep going. Uh, post users. Uh, the thing with post is we want to be able to read the request body that is passed. Uh, for example, with dash d, like we did before in curl. Uh, but for us to do that in in Express or in Node, we have to do we have to install this library called body parser, so that when we actually get the request body in our route handler we could just say request that body or rec that body. That's uh, that's the uh, that's the purpose of body parser. Here we have to uh, specify the options of body parser that we want to use. In this case, we want to be able to parse JSON. You can add more here as, as you like. Uh, 
so here the algorithm that we're using is that uh, we check first if the user provided an ID. If they didn't provide an ID, we're gonna we're gonna error out. If they provide an uh, an ID, and we actually find that that user in our in our in our array, we're gonna error out because the user already exists. We don't want to duplicate users. Uh, other than that, if uh, if those uh, other conditions wasn't met, that means the the user is a new user. We just push that to the array here. And we return all the users as a response. And let's see that in action. All right, so that's the one that we just added post. Uh, then we let's let's try this then. All right, so it just returns all everything. So we have those old ones and then the new one that we just passed. You can test it out more after. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, whenever you send a request. So you send the header signifying that you're sending a JSON data and you're sending the JSON data here with a dash D option. You're enclosing it in strings. So it's serialized. It arrives to the server side uh, like this. So because of body parser, the request.body becomes this exactly. So now you have a nice JSON object already uh, decoded, if you may, already decoded for, for for JavaScript use for you. So that's that's what uh, body parser does. Uh, updating a user. So we use put, but we have to include the ID of the user that we want to edit. It's a bit longer here. Uh, let's walk through that. Uh, so same thing as before, we get the ID of the user that we want to edit. We, we convert that to a number. And then uh, we get the request body also in this case. So whatever's in the request body is, these are the, the, the data attributes that we want to be updated for that particular user. And then basically this loop just finds the user to be updated and updates it. If it finds it and if it didn't find it, it would uh, error out user not found. Uh, there's a lot of ways of doing this uh, in terms of algorithms. Uh, this is probably not even the best way, but uh, just to you know, just to demonstrate, uh, we're looping through each of the user. If the user is found, we we do a uh, we signify it here with a with a true. We found it, and then we spread. We use ESX spread, which I'm gonna show after details. But basically here we're getting the attributes of the of the existing user and then we're and then we're overriding that with the attributes of the data passed from put overriding the ones that are the same key and then we're pushing that to the array and then the other ones we we, we just push so we keep the other ones that didn't match uh that would make more sense if i explain the es6 uh, spread so Let's say this is your object. This is your existing object, right? You have ID name, email, phone. And then this is the updated user properties. Let's say this is the attributes passed from, from your put, from the client's request uh, to put, to edit. So there's an email that is, uh, it has to be, it has to override the existing email, but there's also a new attribute, a new property address that is not there yet. So how we achieve that with spread operator in ES6 or also dot 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 is that we spread the old properties and then we spread the new properties. And the effect of that is it overrides the existing keys like email, but it adds the new keys like, like address. So you end up with this nice uh, updated uh, object 
keeping the old attributes and and the new attributes get uh, get modified right so uh let's try that out oops sorry if i'm switching too much in the in the terminal but uh uh, when I type stuff, you should be able to see what I'm doing. Uh, 0.5, switching to curl. So here, so actually, let, let's see the situation here. We have this user tree. So that's Ronald McDonald with that email and that phone number. You want to modify that with 333, a new phone number and a, a, a fake address. Right, so that's where we're passing slash three to identify the specific user, and then we're passing the data to be to be updated. Uh, so let's try that if that works. Boom. Uh, so let's refresh this page. So it got updated. Cool. So that means it worked. Uh, finally, delete. Uh, we specify the ID of the user to be deleted. Uh, the way we do it, delete is by using filter. It's another array method that here we're passing the, the items that we want to keep. So in this case, we want to keep the ones that don't match the ID of the, the user that we want to delete. Uh, so we filter that, the, we filter the users and then we just return it. If it's not found, if it's the same length after, that means the user was not found. We, we return an error. Uh, the difference between filter and find is that filter returns an array like this, and then find always returns an item. Uh, an example here, you do a filter for this, for this array. Uh, you're looking to get only the items that are divisible by two, right, like here. So you get two and four, and that's how you do it in ES6. Uh, let's test that final one out, 2.6. And let's try the curl. All right, so if our command worked, that means we're not gonna have a three anymore. So we don't have a three anymore, perfect. Uh, so that's it for chapter two. Uh, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that whenever we change something in the server or whenever we restart the server, so uh, uh, hold on to this thought. Right now we have two users because we deleted one of them. But as soon as I, uh, let's say I add a comment here just to restart the server. It's gonna restart the server. And then if I refresh this page, so I have three back. So the reason is that right now we're not persisting the changes to anything. We're 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 just we just have an in-memory copy of this JSON file. We're not writing it there. And the reason we're not writing it there is that we'd rather use a database. So that's more standard. We're gonna see databases in chapter four. But before that, let's uh let's try to do this activity. So I, I'll give you 15 minutes for this one so you can really read what's going on. And if you have any questions, just ask in Slack. So I'll see you in 15 minutes.
All right, welcome back. So uh, I just noticed we don't have a lot of time, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the the recap from part two. If you want me to to really explain it, maybe you could find time after the uh, workshop later. Uh, yeah, you could always go back uh, to the material to review it and post in Slack whenever you have questions. Even after the workshop, you could uh, put some questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to try to discuss this one super quick, uh, but organizing codes is one of those things that might be overlooked when you're, when you're a beginner, uh, but when you actually, uh, work, work in a place that ships code to, to production somewhere, then organizing becomes even more important than writing the code itself. Uh, so these are these are just a few pointers. Environment variables. Uh, the main point of environment variables is for you to not uh, put your your keys in the repo and then you deploy it. Sorry, you push your code to GitHub, and someone goes to your GitHub and then they would just steal your keys. So like database connection keys. So it's better for you to set up an environment variable. Here we do that using dot n, so that uh, once you configure that, you, you put all your keys there, your API keys, uh, database connection string, and all that. You just uh, get it from your file like this, and it, it's just going to work. So, so here, what, what, we, what we did here is we just declared a port here instead of hard coding it. Because that's another thing. When you deploy your, your, your server to... To the cloud, you're not going to use 4,000. You're going to use the default 80. So you want this to really just be specific to your local environment. Uh, there's a lot of other environment variables uh, that that are commonly used, but here we 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 have the port and the database connection keys as an example. Uh, I'm gonna kind of like go quick here. Uh, so using modules in nodes. We have uh, we have been using them already before with uh, require. So we've been using the built-in uh, node modules, built-in modules from Node, and uh, third-party libraries like ex like Express. But we could also declare your own, your own modules, uh, and this is the first way on how you could write a module and export it, so that other codes in your server can use it. You can have like a simple function like this. And let's say you have a you have a constant. So first way is for you to do exports dot. So here you could do exports dot add equals that function there, and you could do exports dot by equals that. So this is a multiple named exports they call because you're exporting multiple stuff. Here is for single uh, default. So we just have an example here of a class. What this class does is it just creates an object. Kind of like a hash map that you could set and get. Uh, you, you could try it later, but uh, that's ex that's the only thing that it does. It's just a glorified uh, hash map we call it the data store. Uh, then we create an instance of that, and then we export that one that one thing. So this is also called the singleton uh, pattern. If you've heard, or if you've used or heard design pattern, this is a singleton. The purpose of this one is that you could use the same instance of, of, of a class throughout your your throughout your your server. So you could import this in like five different places, and you don't have to re reinitialize it every time because that that would be a waste a waste of resources. Uh, for things like this, uh, for some other things like if you're doing OOP, of course you want a different uh, instance of, of a of a dog. When someone wants you to create a, a new instance, for example, uh, and that's how you export that if you're just exporting one thing. And the way you import that is using require, like here. So you do require the name of the file. the the Java the dot js extension is actually optional. You could uh, you don't have to include it. So we require it, and then we assign it to a variable. The variable is the na variable name is up to you. Uh, but here we're just mirroring it, but you could put anything and then you could use it right away. Like you could do, you could call that function that you, you, you imported, call that add or call that by, 
And here, after you import that data store, you could, uh, you know, you could use it. You could uh, set a value and get that value. There's a little code sandbox here. If you wanna, if you wanna play around with the code. Uh, code Sandbox is like this uh, code sharing platform. So I'll let you explore that. Uh, you could actually modify the code there and save it. It will be saved uh, as your own. So, so don't worry, don't worry about modifying that file. It's gonna be saved as your own URL. It's not gonna modify my URL. So a little note on, uh, on traversing directories. This would be more familiar if, if you've worked with, you know, with scripts for a while. Uh, when you say dot slash, that's the same directory. When you say dot dot slash, you want to go up one directory. And the only thing th this whole part is saying that if the thing that you're importing is one directory up, or it's in a folder that is not in this folder, but you know it's it's inside the other folder, kind of like a grandparent, I guess. Anyways, it's one directory up. Uh, you can do dot dot slash. So for main JS to reference cog.js, you have to do dot, 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 slash. And then you could do dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, you know, if it's three levels uh, deep. Uh, one thing we do here, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rushing this part because I think it's better for us to uh, discuss the asynchronous part, the, the modules. I think as long as you read this part, you would, you would figure it out. Uh, one thing that we do here, uh, there's something in the last challenge that uh, it, I think it was in the advanced section that we create a get next ID uh, uh, module, uh, uh, sorry, method, get next ID method. So one exercise here for creating a module is that we move that that uh, method into its own file. So it doesn't clutter your, your server.js. Uh, actually, I could show that quickly. If we... Go to C3.2. Uh, so this one. So now we're, we're importing it. Compared to before, I'm going to backtrack one branch. We are declaring it directly in server.js. And, and the main point here is, uh, you know, after some time, you're going to have a lot of these modules and you're going to have a lot of routes. At some point, your, your file is going to pro be probably 1,000 lines, 2,000 lines, 3,000 lines. That's, that's not good. That is, that's actually a bad code smell, as they call it. Uh, so the sooner you can move stuff out into their own file, uh, you know, the better. Uh, mod modularity is super important, especially things like this that, you know, it makes sense to be in a helper file. So, you know, we, so we put that in a CRUD helper file in a utils folder and we import that using require. And because, you know, server and utils is in the same directory, we could just do uh, dot slash to reference that. And then we, we still use it similarly as before. It's just we have to reference it now with the name of the variable that we used to assign the, the module. Uh, separations of concerns, uh, HTML and JSON. This is really a lot of details about how you could organize your routes and views. So I'm going to give you kind of like a quick five, five to 10 minute rundown of this. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to put uh, we're trying to declutter our, our server.js. If you look at our server.js right now, you have these HTML routes, you have these JSON routes, you have these, uh, you know, you have these route handlers for products, for for foods, for users. So so many. So we want to organize that into different files. So this is kind of the proposed structure. So your routes would be in one place named API for 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 the rest API stuff foods, products, and user. These are the stuff that returns uh, JSON. That's the REST API. And then the, the, the web server stuff, the, the routes that return an HTML file would be in the pages. So index products, you know, foods, users. Uh, and that would contain all the, the HTML that we have. 
right now. So they will all go there. And the way you organize that in Express is using a router. So let's say we want to move out. Uh, we want to move out the products. So all this. Uh, let me just put that somewhat. So we want to move out all of these product routes into their own file and just import it from server.js. So you can create, you know, a folder routes slash API that's products. You create a router like this, and that router kind of encapsulates all the routes you need. For, for that particular uh, resource, for that particular uh, resource, and then you know you you export that router, and then from your server file, from your server file you just import that with a require, and then you have to mount it. This is the important part to make it work. You have to mount it using uh, server use, and uh, mounting that in the root, which is slash, uh, allows you to keep the structure of, of your of your route. Like here we have we already established this to our clients, so we have slash product slash ID. So when we move it out, you want to keep that so the clients don't have to, to change their, their, their route. What I mean by that is that if you use root, you get to keep the slash products so your clients access slash products. But let's say you mount your 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 router to something with a uh, you know, some some route, not 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 a root route, a non-root route. It gets added, so now your clients have to access slash routes slash products. So in in that case, you know, you have to you have to deprecate your old uh, API, those things like that. So also just be mindful of that. And we we do the whole uh, exercise here of moving them. I'm not gonna show it in detail because uh, we're running a bit out of time. Uh, and you know you you also moved your your view. So here we moved all the routes to their own file to API. But here we're also moving the uh, the HTML. Well, we moved them to something called the views folder. This is kind of a, a really standard way of, of where standard uh, place to put all of your views, all of your HTML. So we move all of them there inside the views and and same thing we, we import that from here so here we require routes pages index for all the index pages products pages for all the page page products and, and so on uh, we use process.cwd uh, because this way we can't we can't really use the if you remember the underscore underscore dear name that we used before where we get the directory of the current file. Here we have to we have to find out the root of the server because if we get the their name, you're gonna get this, which you don't want. You don't want your users to go route slash pages slash views slash index. That's long. So here you want to just get the root folder plus the the relative path. So uh, you know just be careful of organizing your 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 paths there. Make sure that that it adds up. Uh, a little side note here: Why are we not allowed to do their name plus you know two directories up? Because that's a security uh, that's a security issue that no one should be able to traverse your 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 local directory from your machine, right? Or when you deploy it in the cloud, you don't want any client to be able to dot dot slash dot dot slash to access. The, the directories outside of your of your of your uh, server of your uh, yeah of your deployed server, so that's the whole point of that. And lastly, there's this really standard way of handling your .env configs. You you put them in a config.js file. You also require them. Uh, you do the co configuration there, and you access them. Uh, you expose them here at the bottom. And then from your server file, you just require one, one config. So the reason is you don't want to do this whole thing of requiring dot and sorry, doing the dot and config for like three files uh, from server, from products, from foods, blah blah blah. So right now we just need it. We just uh, import one thing, and that's it. We could just access it right away. 
like that. So I'm not going <laughs> to make, make you do the activity because uh, we kind of rushed through that. But yeah, uh, try to really do it uh, later on your own time. So I want to really get to the asynchronous programming. At least we have, uh, we have like around half an hour. So yeah, so now that our, let me actually just get that code at least. Uh, we're going to do some, something here. So we can, all right. So that's updated. Uh, so the result of, of those, the, those uh, decluttering, organizing, uh, the end result of that is, you know, we have a utils folder here. You have a views folder here. You have your routes separated by the REST API. That's for the REST API, and this is for the web server. So it, it's kind of neat. And then if you look at the server.js, uh, it's all, you know, it's all decluttered. You only have 40 lines. It, it looks it looks a lot cleaner, right? So that's what we're aiming for. But now let's go to asynchronous programming. Uh, single thread and, and, and synchronous. Uh, so JavaScript is actually not really asynchronous. It just allows you to write asynchronous code. Uh, if you want details, you could click that link. Uh, but what asynchronous programming means is that you could do non-blocking code and event. Uh, and non-blocking code means whenever you do a data fetch or file operation or something asynchronous, it doesn't block execution. You can still continue execution to the next line. And event-driven means uh, like what we were doing before, uh, when you listen to the, when the server start listening, uh, you know execute this thing. Uh, so you kind of respond to events instead of uh, declaring a, a specific program flow. Uh, so we start with callbacks uh, because we had callbacks before, right? So the the routes the route handlers that we were writing are actually callbacks. So here we're technically saying if the client goes to slash users, execute this callback function. But the server's not just waiting around uh, blocked while the user does nothing, like the client does nothing. The, the server does something else. It has a lot of things to do uh, on its free time. But when the client actually requests that, that route, then the server responds to that event. So that's, that's the whole idea of the event driven. And uh, that's the core concept of callbacks. So the sender, uh, so now we're going to talk in terms of uh, sender and receiver. The sender is the one that is using an asynchronous function. So the sender sends a function along with, with a request, and the receiver will call back that, that sender at a later time. There's an analogy here, you know, whenever you call a store or an office reception or a doctor, uh, you're asking for results for something, or you, you want someone you want to talk to someone, but no one's available. They they said, okay, leave your number, and we're gonna give you a call back. So that's exactly the same uh, uh, meaning of a callback. You you give a function to the server, and when the server has your results, it's gonna it's gonna call you back. Uh, a little diagram there for those of you who like looking at diagrams. Uh, so yeah, you you send an async uh, request. The the server does its thing, processes your, processes your request, and then when it's ready, it 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 calls your callback with the data. So now your app can do the something with the data around here. Uh, that's exactly what I uh, what I was uh, saying. And we have a little analogy here uh, that we could explore pizza analogy, uh, this is synchronous, for example. You order, let's say you have a function to order pizza, and as a client, you order a pizza, and then if it's synchronous programming, it blocks here, right? Oh, so actually, sorry, it blocks here. So until you have the pizza, you can't do anything else. You know, you, you, can't, you can't go here, for example, even though you're just waiting for the pizza. So in real life, you're literally just frozen, waiting for waiting for the pizza to be finished here. So that's synchronous programming. On the other hand, if it's asynchronous programming, you could put the eat pizza here as a callback to the order pizza function. 
So you order a pizza, fine, and then it continues to the next line. Uh, fine, so you could do something else, you could read, you could game, you could study while waiting for the pizza. And when that pizza arrives, boom, now you eat the pizza. So it's a, it's a non-blocking way to do things. And it, it's event-driven too, because you only do that part when it actually arrives. So there's some kind of magic happening there. Uh, this is how you. This is an example of how you do that in in real world scenarios, fetching data uh, with callbacks. Uh, so let's say this is asynchronous function uh, receives uh, uh, does something asynchronous like fetching data. It receives a success and failure and failure callback. Uh, so uh, as a user, as a user of, of that of that code, you also have to send a success and failure callback like here. See? And so you might end up, if you do that a lot, uh, you might end up with something called a callback hell, actually, because let's say you want to just order your code to do something asynchronous, but after that, do this, but after that, do this. So now you end up with kind of like a pyramid structure, no, also known as callback hell. Uh, you could change so many events just to achieve some kind of order of execution. So now we end up with, with promises. So promises came with the ES6 update. You could have this kind of magical uh, promise or IOU. The way I want to think about it is like a check. Someone gives you a check. Uh, you know, you could cash that check out later, but right now it's kind of, you know, it's kind of good as money, right? But later the, the, the check can bounce, but, uh, but it could also succeed. So who knows? But uh, if someone owes you money and they give you a check, it's as good as money. Uh, so you, you send an asynchronous uh, uh, request. The server returns a promise. Server does processing. And just, just like magic, when, when it, uh, this promise resolves itself, and then you have the data. Uh, the way you do it with a pizza analogy is with a den. So you order pizza. And then uh, you do something with the pizza when it arrives. So, so this whole thing results in, in a promise, right? You can see that here that this thing returns a promise. And the, the user, the, uh, the sender of, of that request can then chain that promise and do something with it using that then. So it's kind of a different structure. Uh, you do the same thing with uh, data fetching. You return a a promise, and then you you know from from the client from the user side you do a then, and if there's an error you do a catch. Uh, in replacement to the success callback and and failure callbacks, uh, then again you could end up with something called a uh, promise hell. So you have to do something that then, and then after that do this, then after this do that. So all of this structure, we really can't avoid it. And that is the price of, of you know, doing asynchronous code and trying to achieve some kind of order. Uh, there's two ways to go, uh, you know, to mitigate that. Uh, first thing is if you declare an actual function, you can, uh, these are all anonymous function, right? We, we don't, we didn't really name this function right here. It's an anonymous function, but the way you could kind of, Organize it a little bit is name your functions like this. So you have this function, do this after, and then you have another function, do this after, after. So you pass this function as a callback to, to, to the first one. So they kind of chain nicely without the whole pyramid thing going on. Uh, another way is a, a new, uh, another update, which is ES8, I think, or ES7. Uh, they introduced the async await, which allows you to write uh, asynchronous code just like, so it looks like asynchronous. A what I mean by that is you actually achieve that, uh, that order that you want. For example, here, so we made this, this order pizza async, uh, and inside of it, we do await. So that's a requirement. Whenever you, you do await somewhere, you have to make the function async. Uh, so in this example, the second one, 
we could just await the, the pizza. Await the pizza and then eat the pizza when it comes back. So here you're still kind of like writing a uh, synchronous code because you don't have a success callback, you don't have a dot then. It really looks like you're just you're just writing like you know synchronous code, which is which is nice uh for real real scenarios the, the pizza it doesn't look as useful but uh yeah so here in the data fetching part it's kind of neat here so the way you catch errors with a sync await you have to enclose them in, in try catch uh this other part actually because a sync await is really just promise uh it's kind of just a, a syntactic sugar around promises so you could still handle uh, async await functions just like a promise, like with a dot then and a dot catch, right? Because it's still just promises with a with a you know uh, kind of like a sy syntax improvement. But behind the scenes, you could still do this. So you have two options on how to how to call async await functions. Uh, all right. Wow. Uh, we only have thirty minutes. Uh, so, so let me get quick to the the database part. What we're gonna do in part two is, uh, since we're probably gonna have more time, I want to discuss maybe this part in detail and uh, and and the asynchronous programming kind of like do a do a review of that. But uh, I just want to kind of touch the important parts of this right now before we finish. Uh, so database, the reason why we had to discuss asynchronous uh, programming be before databases is because the cloud database that we're using, we actually have to await, we have to, we have to await until the database gets connected. And I'll show you that right here. So we have promises, we have async await, so we we also here we also go through the exercise of converting uh, our MongoDB uh, connection from callback to promise to async await. See here we had to await until that connection succeeds because you know we're connecting to a cloud database. We don't know maybe our network is slow, maybe something is you know in between here and wherever MongoDB servers are. You know we don't know when that's going to finish. So it's it's a it's an asynchronous operation. So here it's the end result is it's a nice await here, uh, connecting to the database. And uh, MongoDB has a, has a very specific syntax. Uh, I invite you to, to to look at that in details with this document. But for example, okay, we got our we got our database connection here. We we, we connect to our our database. We we get to our collection products, which is kind of like the equivalence of tables in SQL. And then from there, we just do a find. So whenever you use a find in, in MongoDB, it's uh, and you don't pass uh, parameters, you're just getting everything. So here, we're getting all the products and then converting it to an array. And then when it comes back, we, we log the result. Uh, and then we, we make an attempt to to modularize that so that everything happens in, in one file. So here we also use a singleton pattern so that every class that, that uses the that uses uh, the database don't have to reinitialize the database every time. So what's what happens here is uh, actually I'm gonna pull out the code. C 4.4 What I'm gonna do is for next installment for part two, I'm gonna do a survey on where where everyone want, wants to start uh, the discussion. You want to start with the organizing code, the sync, or, or here, because uh, we definitely didn't didn't cover it in detail. Uh, sorry about that. I, I think, like I said before, the, the point of this workshop is is really uh, you know to discuss everything in detail. So. We just kind of tried to cover as much as we can. And right now I'm just uh, trying to see where we can go for, 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 uh, for the part two. OK. 
coming back to what I was saying before. So we have 4.1. We have our singleton module here. So this is the meat of the database connection. You have a class here, right? And then you, it's a singleton class. So you create an instance and then you export it. So when you go to your uh, server, for example, uh, sorry, server, or where is that? Oh, it's in products. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, routes, API products. So you could just require that database file. And what happens is for the other routes, for foods and for users, you, you just have to ex, uh, import that one file. And it would be initialized already if someone initialized it. So it only gets initialized once. Uh, that, that's, that's the key point here. Uh, when, when the foods resource needs it, it doesn't have to reinitialize it again. So what happens here is that you know, we initialize some, some values for the connection. Uh, this MongoDB connection string, this is the one that I ask you to get from, from the setup. Uh, this should be placed in your env file. If you have an env file, you put it there. You get a nice warning there if, 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 if you didn't. Uh, we connect with callback here. Uh, so that's 4.1. And then, oops, 4.4. Okay, we have the we have the the promise here. All right, so this one connects to the database and it just returns the instance. You know, so this is kind of like a wrapper, so that when you when you have your connection here from your from your resources, you just get get collection, and then. Uh, the actual application goes in the next part. So now you can just await, you know, you await the connection to, to, to connect to your, your collection, just products, and then you await for the results and then you return it. So here we actually remove all of those logic that we added before for finding products, uh, adding, uh, finding one product, adding a new, adding a new uh, product, all of those CRUD logic becomes uh, part of, uh, rem uh, they get removed because now we use uh, the equivalent in MongoDB. So nice syntax like that, you update one with that ID and then you just pass the updated product. So kind of like the CRUD we did before, but with a different syntax and a little, a little added complexity of the, uh, of the asynchronousness of the database. So uh, I'm gonna stop here because I wanted to uh, give a chance uh, for you to fill out the survey. Uh, yeah, so we're at 8.30. Uh, so yeah, like, like, like I said before, uh, once we do the part two next time, we could either start uh, anywhere here. So we're definitely not gonna start with chapter two because we discussed that in detail, but we could start either tree or the asynchronous programming or the database. So um, I'm gonna put a, a poll in, in Slack regarding that, but uh, right now we don't have an exact date for the for the next chapter, uh, for the next part, for part two of the workshop, but uh, stay tuned uh, uh, and make sure you, you know, you, you open your Slack once in a while, or, or I'll try to really uh, put an announcement there when we have the dates for that one. Uh, so sorry to be a bit over time, but uh, yeah, uh, if you could please do the survey here. Um, I'm gonna send you the link also in Slack for this one. Uh, yeah, there's some questions in Slack. I'm gonna answer that uh, while you're doing the survey.
So yeah, so, uh, well. The background. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for attending the workshop. Uh, I know we didn't have a lot of time, but I'm actually happy that we get to discuss two full chapters before I went autopilot there. Uh, so uh, for the next install installment, we're going to uh, pick up where we left off or we're probably going to discuss uh, some of those uh, chapters that we, we kind of fast forwarded. We're going to discuss them in detail. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Oh, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to stay online for like another half an hour. If any of you wants to discuss or, uh, or, or just ask questions, I'm going to be online on Slack. So thanks. Bye. -bye. Yeah, and by the way, for those for those who are uh, here right now, uh, uh, someone reminded me. So th thanks for for Lila for reminding me. But uh, I'm as I mentioned before, I'm I'm a mentor, so I'm I'm mentoring uh, right now. So if you're interested, if you want to have a mentor, uh, message me in Slack. I think that's the best way to reach me. So we could set up set that up. I'm gonna send you a form to fill up about you know about the mentorship if you know, how, how I'll be able to help you, uh, and other details. So yeah, definitely reach out if, if you're interested in the mentorship.